Spain's Prime Minister Pedro Sánchez ends his latest Middle East tour in Qatar at a crucial time for the wider region. The Gulf state has hosted several talks on ending Israel's war on Gaza. Prime Minister Sánchez calls for a ceasefire and for Israel to respect international law have resonated worldwide. While he strongly condemned the October the 7th attack, Sánchez has also demanded the protection of civilians caught up in Israel's war on Gaza. As the death toll now stands at around 33,000, Spain's voice is growing louder in the international arena, demanding access to humanitarian aid and advocating for a recognized Palestinian state. Spain's foreign policy extends beyond the Middle East. It balances relations with major powers like the United States and Russia while navigating the broader implications of the war in Ukraine. Prime Minister Sanchez is at the crossroads of these complex geopolitical dynamics how will Spain manage this era of global challenges and a rapidly changing international landscape? The Spanish Prime Minister, Pedro Sanchez, talks to Al Jazeera. Pedro Sanchez, Spanish Prime Minister, thank you for talking to Al Jazeera. You were one of the first leaders in the world to call for a ceasefire in Gaza. I looked it up, it was the 21st of October last year. At the time you spoke, 4,651 Palestinians had been killed. Now so many others are calling for a ceasefire. Uh, the US has dropped its objection at the UN Security Council. We got a UN Security Council resolution. Yet the death toll now stands around 33,000. That means that more than 28,000 people, many of them women and children, have died since you first made your call for a ceasefire. Does that anger you? I have to tell you, well, first of all, thank you very much for, for this uh, interview. And uh, I have to share with you that sometimes I feel very frustrated because, uh, uh, of course, we've been very vocal since the beginning of this war. Uh, we condemn these uh, horrible and terrible uh, terrorist attacks uh, perpetrated by Hamas. Uh, we, we condemn those attacks, but, of course, we uh, ask for a permanent ceasefire since... Uh, two, three weeks after these uh, terrorist attacks. And the, and the reason is that uh, you, you cannot uh, answer uh, these uh, kind of uh, attacks only with uh, weapons or with the uh, logic of war. There's other ways to deal with uh, these uh, terrible situations. And, and that is why, you know, I think it's, it's really important to, 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 to have the engagement of the old international community in order to to ask for a ceasefire, to, to allow the, the, uh, the humanitarian aid to access uh, into Gaza, and of course, uh, the immediate and urgent uh, release of, of hostages. Of course, there is no ceasefire in place. The guns went silent for a little bit at the end of November, just for seven days. When the Security Council finally passed its resolution, all its members welcomed it. Even the US that abstained said positive things. It was welcomed by the Palestinian Authority, it was even welcomed by Hamas. Mm. The only people who didn't welcome that Security Council resolution, in fact, vehemently condemned it, were Israel. Mm. Is Israel an obstacle to peace at this stage? I think that uh, Netanyahu and his government, with this uh, strategy, is uh, getting more and more isolated internationally. In the beginning, I think that we all uh, feel that solidarity with uh, uh, citizens and uh, a society that was attacked by by a terrorist uh, uh, organization. But afterwards, this uh, unbalanced and uh, horrible situation that uh, appealed uh, all the international community is uh, putting uh, Prime Minister Netanyahu in a very difficult and isolated situation uh, within the international community. I can see, for instance, also in Europe, uh, in the beginning of the war, some countries more aligned with the position, the political position of, of Israel that nowadays have changed and shifted uh, their position that dramatically because uh, their own societies are asking for a more uh, tough and uh, clear uh, political positions towards what we are unfortunately witnessing in, in Gaza. In Spain, I, I can say that uh, uh, the majority of uh, our citizens, uh, they do believe that uh, we need peace. We, we need to restore peace. We need to 
have an urgent uh, and permanent ceasefire on the ground, and of course to uh, to answer the the most urgent uh, issue nowadays in Gaza, which is how can we allow uh, the entry of humanitarian aid uh, on on the, with the proportionality to uh, respond to this humanitarian crisis that we are or the Gazatees are suffering. You're on a visit to the region. You've been to Jordan, you've been to Saudi Arabia, and you're now in Qatar. And um, here in Doha, along with Cairo, this is one of the places that they've been trying to get a deal on a ceasefire in talks. What's the latest you're hearing about that? Do you believe it's close? I don't have, uh, I don't have uh, information if it's close or not. Uh, what I can share with you is my, my will, and I think the will of... Uh, the majority of the international community, which is to have this permanent ceasefire. And I have to also to remember that uh, the resolutions of the Security Council are binding for all member states, also for Israel. So uh, I think it's uh, mandatory for the uh, government of Prime Minister Netanyahu, of course, to, to have this permanent ceasefire. And I think this will be a, a very important step in order to to give a, a political horizon to the region in order to open a peace process co that could uh, end uh, to uh, the international recognition, the mutual recognition uh, for the Israelis and for the Palestine people. You talk about binding Security Council resolutions. There's not just the one on the ceasefire. At the end of last year, there were two resolutions yep. that more aid should go in. Yep. The International Court of Justice, which also has binding measures it's announced twice, says the same thing should happen, more aid should go in. And yet it's not happening. Do you think Israel is in breach of the Security Council resolutions, the International Court of Justice measures? And if so, what, what action should be taken? I, I think that uh, there's uh, actually some doubts in the in the sense that you are uh, uh, saying, and I can tell you that within the European Union, for instance, two governments, the Irish government and also the Spanish government, we ask uh, uh, the European Commission to make an assessment on the humanitarian uh, rules, articles that are included in the uh, uh, strategic relation that the European Union has with, the, with Israel. That's the agreement that, the that agreement, was signed yes. between the EU exactly. and Israel. And, and, if, you, and, and if, if they find that Israel's not living up to its respect for human rights, for example, mm -hmm. that is in that agreement, what action should be taken? Well, in the case of the European Union, the, 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 the situation will be that uh, there's an, uh, an open door to, to, to have a debate within the European Council uh, in order to, um, to see if we uh, continue with this strategic relation or not. But this is something that first we need to have the assessment of, of the European Commission. But anyhow, uh, as, as I said before, the, the, the important thing is that nowadays, uh, since the beginning of the war, more and more countries, especially in the in Western world, are uh, more reluctant to support and back what uh, Prime Minister Netan Netanyahu and his government is doing in Gaza. And there's an urgency to stop this terrible war and to open a, a new phase of uh, stability, peace, prosperity in the region. And I think that for Europe, for instance, this is not only a, a, a moral conviction, which is the case. It's also in our geopolitical interest. It's in our geopolitical interest to have a stable and prosperous and peaceful uh, Middle East. Uh, so this is something that I have I've, I've been advocating and, and that is why we've been very vocal also within the European Union in order to, to have this approach and, uh, and, uh, and also to have a, a, a strategic vision of what to do from the European Union with our southern neighbourhood, which, by the way, I can tell you, I think that there's plenty of opportunities for the European Union and also for uh, the, these uh, countries in, in, the, in, in the Middle East and the Mediterranean. Humanitarians have repeatedly come under attack in Gaza and the latest tragic incident, seven workers from the World Central Kitchen, that's the NGO set up by the Spanish chef Jose Andres, were killed. Yeah. They'd also been working together with a Spanish NGO yeah. which had brought their food supplies in by ship. Mm. They'd come by ship because Israel's not allowing enough st stuff in by land. How is any of this acceptable? It is not acceptable. I think that it's important to condemn uh, this terrible situation and the very dangerous, uh, extremely dangerous uh, uh, circumstances uh, that uh, aid workers are working uh, or, uh, yes, uh, having on the ground in Gaza. 
And that is why I think it's important, first of all, as I did, to condemn this uh, horrible bombing uh, that causes the death of uh, seven workers, which, by the way, were working in Gaza because people in Gaza are starving mm. and they need food. And this NGO, uh, led by this Spanish chef, Jose Andres, what they do is just to provide uh, food for the people. And, uh, and, of course, what we ask uh, the Israeli government is uh, to uh, clarify uh, the, the, the situation and, uh, and why this happened uh, in Gaza. Of course, this isn't a one-off. More humanitarian Absolutely. workers have died in Gaza than anywhere else in the world. Uh, 150 or more okay. UN staff members, more medical staff yep. than anywhere else in the world. This begs the question, is the Israeli army just very, very bad at targeting? Or is it about their rules of engagement? Is there some sort of indiscriminate shoot-to-kill policy going on here? I don't know. Uh, this is something that the Israeli government has to answer. What I can tell you is that the situation on the ground is not acceptable. Uh, and this brings me again to the same answer that I gave you since mm. the beginning of the interview. We need a permanent ceasefire. We need to, uh, to convene a peace conference which, by the way, is something, a proposal that not only the European Union, but also the Arab League and uh, the Islamic Conference, we agreed on. So I think it's important that from Europe and also from the Arab countries, we work together in this peace conference in order to, to, to move forward uh, and to leave behind this uh, terrible war and to establish the conditions for a peaceful uh, coexistence in, in, in the short term. You say Israel needs to answer these questions. Yes, Does Israel definitely. potentially need to answer these questions to the International Criminal Court? Does there need to be accountability for these sort of actions? There has to be always accountability. I think that the history is full of examples where it's urgent and needed this kind of accountability. But this is something that the, the International uh, Court of Justice has to respond. And uh, what we need to do is to uh, ask uh, the Israeli government to fulfill, which is nowadays binding, which is, of course, the UN uh, resolutions calling for a, a permanent ceasefire. We've talked about humanitarian workers, medical staff, journalists as well. More journalists have died in Gaza than anywhere else in the world. Uh, now Prime Minister Netanyahu's government is banning Al Jazeera's operations in yeah. Israel. Is this quite literally a case of Israel shooting the messenger? Yeah, well, I mean, the free press is uh, on the hallmark of any, uh, I would say, self-respecting uh, 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 democratic government. And uh, from my side and from the Spanish side, what we do is to, uh, to support uh, the, uh, the, the work uh, uh, made by you know, journalists across the world, and especially in Gaza, in these very difficult circumstances. You've talked about the famine in Gaza, yeah. which now the integrated food security phase classification report, which came out a couple of weeks ago, says is coming, the full onset between now and May. It is a man-made famine, is it not? Would you not agree it's quite specifically an Israeli-made famine? What I do believe is, uh, and I was, I was in Rafa uh, at that time, you mentioned in the beginning mm. of, the, of the interview, it, it, is, it is critical that, uh, that Israel opens uh, the possibility to, uh, to have this humanitarian aid going into Gaza as soon as possible. And perhaps we're talking about, of course, land crossings, and of course, in the amount of 1,000 or 2,000 trucks per day. This is the terrible situation that the people in Gaza are suffering, and this is something that the international community cannot accept. And, uh, and that is why, I think that uh, not only from the uh, UN Security Council, also from the European Union Council, uh, we had a, a, a council uh, some weeks ago, we uh, commend uh, the Israeli government to open these land crosses in order to have uh, available uh, these humanitarian aid for the uh, Gazatees. With regard to the EU, Joseph Borrell is the High Representative yep. for Foreign Affairs. He used to be your Foreign Minister, you know him well. He said recently, if you believe too many people are being killed, maybe you should provide less arms in order to prevent so many people being killed. Does the EU need to stop selling weapons to Israel? And are you sure your country is no longer selling any weapons? We're no longer uh, selling uh, weapons. And I, I do agree with uh, this statement uh, made by uh, Joseph Borrell. 
And uh, what I can tell you is that um, I don't think that this strategy is going to uh, give more security to the Israeli uh, society after this war ends. Because I think that uh, the only way to, to have a, a peaceful coexistence and the security that the Israeli people needs is through politics and through diplomacy, and not with war and this especially terrible war that we're witnessing in Gaza. So many leaders, including yourself, have been not warning... Not only in Gaza, also in, in the West Bank, where well, we are Well, and maybe witnessing... beyond, and yep. that's what I wanted to ask you about, because so many leaders, including yourself, have warned about the danger Absolutely. of this war spreading. In that context, Israel's recent attack on an Iranian diplomatic building in the Syrian capital, Damascus, do you think killed top officials of the Quds Force? Do you think that was acceptable or a reckless act of provocation? It's by not Israel? acceptable. It's not acceptable. It needs to be clarified by Israeli government. And of course, this uh, goes in the direction that you mentioned before, which is we need to avoid an escalation of the conflict in the region. Uh, from Spain, we have deployed many years ago uh, one of our largest uh, UN missions on the ground, which is in Lebanon. Mm. And, uh, and, of course, we are uh, trying to, to guarantee the peaceful coexistence between the Lebanese people and the Israeli people in that uh, very difficult border between uh, these two countries. And, uh, and we are very concerned about the situation, and that is why we ask and we uh, commend the Israeli government to, uh, to try to avoid this, this, uh, this regional escalation that we are witnessing, for instance, with this uh, attack in, in Syria. When the war is eventually over, who should run Gaza and who should pay to rebuild it? Should Israel be required, for example, to pay reparations for some of the damage they've caused? In my opinion, the Palestine Authority is our partner for the international community, and I think that they have... Uh, uh, the capacity, and if they don't have the capacity, we need to give them that capacity uh, to get the full responsibility of uh, over Gaza, uh, East Jerusalem, and also uh, the West Bank. And uh, from uh, the Spanish perspective, I think that we are living now a moment where uh, the international community as a whole, we must recognize the full membership of Palestine in the UN system and, of course, bilaterally, uh, from uh, the case of Spain, we are ready to, to, to support and recognize the state of Palestine. Because this momentum has to be different to the others that we, we, we witnessed uh, over the past seven decades, which is, OK, if we convene this uh, international peace conference, uh, the Palestine must come to the table with a recognition uh, taken by the international community of their own state. And uh, the, the debates with the international community and the, with, with the Israeli government, in my view, should be uh, what would be the borders, what would be, uh, let's say, the, 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 the government, and so on and so forth. You talk about the Palestinian Authority. Yep. Prime Minister Netanyahu says the Palestinian Authority can't run Gaza afterwards. How is the international community going to strong-arm the Israelis on issues like this? If you have the Prime Minister in Israel, such as you know, Netanyahu, who has been uh, trying to weaken uh, the Palestine Authority over the past years, this is, uh, this is the consequence that we are now witnessing in Gaza. Uh, what we need is to uh, reinvigorate uh, the Palestine Authority. I think it's important, uh, and we are ready to work uh, along with our friend the President Abbas and, of course, the new Prime Minister of the Palestine Authority. But I think that, uh, you know, they have to take that full responsibility of Gaza, uh, the West Bank and East Jerusalem. And, and of course, again, the international community must uh, take a very important step in order to, to recognize uh, the state of Palestine. And, by the way, also, I think the, the, there's a momentum for a mutual recognition. Also, some Arab countries have to recognise Israel too, in order to, to have this uh, peaceful coexistence. The problem is, Prime Minister Netanyahu, you talk about two-state solution and whatever, yep. he doesn't believe in that either. Well, actually, it's one-state solution, because the other one is already recognised, I mean, Israel, by most of the countries, and especially in the Western world. So this is why I think it's, it's one-state solution, and that one-state solution 
uh, will bring to, to the recognition of Palestine as a state. And I can tell you, within the European Union, of course, Spain, we've been very vocal since the beginning, but there are more and more countries that are more and more uh, sympathetic with, with this idea. And in terms of recognition, there's another thing going on, which is if, if Palestine is going to be a, a state, it needs to be a UN member as well. Absolutely. And, and the Palestinian ambassador to the UN has sent a letter to the UN Secretary General. That's the first step. Mm. And then they go to the Security Council. I'm told around the Security Council table, among the 15 members, they have the nine votes they need. The question is the Americans, because they have veto power and they could veto this. What is your message to the US on Palestine becoming a UN member and on recognitions? Should the US recognise Palestine as a state as well? I, I think that the, the, the Biden administration is, you know, trying to do their best in order to uh, find a political solution to this terrible war. Uh, so I, I recognise that political will. Uh, second, uh, what we saw first in the Ukrainian war and afterwards in, 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 in Gaza is that uh, more and more uh, politically the debate uh, and the influence are not in the Security Council but on the General Assembly. I do believe that in the General Assembly there's a huge majority of countries uh, uh, that agree with this uh, petition made by, by the Palestine Authority to, to get that full membership of the UN. Around the General Assembly, though, and countries on the General Assembly, and I've had it on this programme um, uh, with, with, with the President of Brazil, for example, yep. there's a claim there's double standards going on here. When you look at Ukraine and Gaza, if attacking hospitals and bombing civilians is wrong in Ukraine, then why was it not wrong in Gaza? Do you think the Gaza statements, the Gaza policies of some of your other Western allies are going to make it harder to get international support for the other war that's still going on, perhaps we're not focusing on it so much, in Ukraine? From my perspective, what I see is that uh, we have a, po a current position, uh, I mean in Spain, and we are with Ukraine because we defend a world order based on rules. And one of these uh, main pillars, as you know quite well, is the respect of, uh, of the international uh, of the national sovereignty and the territorial integrity of a country, which is nowadays uh, uh, not respected by, by the way, a full member of the UN Security Council, uh, uh, the Putin regime, no, Russia. And, and because we are current, we also are current and uh, very vocal on uh, the, the war in Gaza, because what we are uh, witnessing uh, tabled a lot of uh, questions. One of them, if, if it's uh, Israel respecting or not and fulfilling or not the UN Security Council resolutions or, or for instance, the international humanitarian law. So, uh, again, I think that uh, because we are current in Ukraine and in Gaza, we are uh, defending you know, the international law. How worried are you about the situation in Ukraine? Because a year ago, there was all this talk of a counter-offensive by the Ukrainians. Since then, and in recent months, very slowly, it seems the Russian side are the ones that are making gains. Gaza has all the attention. It means that potentially the funding, the weapons are going away from Ukraine. And then you have another spectre on the horizon in November, you might get President Trump back in the White House, who might pull the plug from President Zelensky completely. Are you worried that Ukraine's going to lose this war? I don't think that Ukraine is going to lose this war, because today everybody in the world knows that there is a nation called Ukraine that wants to uh, be respected and defend their, their own uh, freedom in order to be closer to the European Union and to our values and, by the way, to be a member of, of the European Union in the, in the coming uh, future. So I, I don't think that they're going to lose the war. And I don't think that uh, Putin is going to win the war. Not at all, because in, in the beginning of the war, what he wanted to do is to invade 100% uh, of the territory of Ukraine. And this is not the case anymore. So I think that uh, the big risk is that we are witnessing a kind of uh, frozen conflict. Prime Minister, you skillfully dodged the last part of my question. Which, um, President Putin, you yeah. say, is not going to win the war in Ukraine. He's not going to win but the war. President Trump might well win the election 
in November. He says he can sort this out in a day. He could undercut President Zelensky. And as you know, there are all sorts of fears. I mean, he's, he's doubting Article 5, the basic rule of the NATO Charter, the all-for-one rule. If one's attacked, you all, support, you all support them. Are you worried about the possible return of President Trump? Well, I'm a progressive uh, prime minister. My government is a progressive one, so what I would like to have is, uh, well, first of all, uh, have great relations with President Biden and his administration. Uh, and, you know, I would like to be him re-elected as, uh, as president of the US, but this is something that has to be responded by the US citizens. What we, were, we are looking for is to have the best relations with the US administration, uh, Trump, or Biden, or who, who is in charge of and leading the country. And I think one of the major bones between the US and, uh, and Europe is uh, NATO is our transatlantic bone, our transatlantic relation. And I think this is above the prime minister or the president of one or other country. You no, know, it's, it's something that is strategic for the security, not only for Europe, but also for the US. And, uh, and uh, so I don't, I don't think that we are gonna witness a, a, a weakened uh, position of NATO in, in the coming years in the case that uh, Trump wins the elections. Uh, what we are going to, to, to witness is what we are uh, seeing over the past two years, which is a, a stronger NATO. And this is caused by uh, Putin's war. This is the, the paradox. The paradox is that uh, what Putin wants uh, was not only to, uh, uh, to invade U Ukraine, but also to weaken the NATO. And what he has uh, accomplished is the contrary. Now you have Sweden, you have Finland, uh, you have a stronger uh, NATO, and then uh, within the European Union, we have a, a stronger conscience that we need to do more on our uh, defense and deterrence capacity. And this is something that we are already uh, uh, doing uh, within the European Union. So I, I always say that we don't have a problem with the Russian society, but we have a problem with a regime which is uh, putting into question the borders and therefore the security, not only of Ukraine, but also of, of Europe and therefore of the whole world. And this is something that we need again uh, to solve uh, through diplomatic uh, uh, ways. Uh, but unfortunately, uh, today uh, is, is not possible. Let's see and let's hope that in the future we can find that way. Spanish Prime Minister Pedro Sanchez, thank you for talking to Al Jazeera. Thank you very much. Thanks very much indeed.